comedy show. We'll continue with our next inductee. You know, this past October, I celebrated 25 years of doing this stuff, and the one thing that I love so much is seeing people that I've watched from the very beginning all the way up. Our next inductee, he is a graduate of the Killer Kowalski Institute of Professional Wrestling, and he likes his peanut butter smooth, ladies and gentlemen. Trey, the smooth operating gangsta, and... Hold on, here to induct Trey into the New England Pro Wrestling Hall of Fame, I want to welcome his children, Trey Jr. and Carly, to induct their dad into the New England Pro Wrestling Hall of Fame. Thank you very much. I am 
humble, grateful. Thank you. And third, certainly not least, is my teacher, the late Walter Killer Cobos. This is for Killer. Clap for Killer. We can do better. Okay. gave me an opportunity to express myself in a way that I've never been able to express myself and never would have had an opportunity to express, to express myself that way. So when I first found a Walter Kilikowski professional wrestling, October of 1991, before I grew into my man body, I was a buck 60 soaked and wet. I figured I would walk upstairs and either be a manager or a referee. So, you walk upstairs, anybody who's been to Kilikowski Pro Wrestling Hall of Fame, you hear all the grunts and groans and smashes and boom, boom, boom. I'm like, oh, it must be giants up there killing each other. So I walked in there and I see three people in the ring that were smaller than me. I said to myself, I can throw you, I can throw you, and I can definitely throw you. Sign me up. So I went to Walter and uh, talked to him and asked what the tuition was. He said, $1,500. I said, okay, you take a check or a credit card? $1,500 cash. You got a payment plan? Yes. $500 one month, $500 month two, $700 month three. Walter, that's $1,700. I know $1,500 cash. <laughs> so that was a Tuesday. I went to the bank the next day, Wednesday, got a cash advance for $1,500. I went to school Thursday, gave Walter $1,500 called cash. He did not count it. So I'm gonna count it. It's all there, it's all there. I know it's all there. I went to work that following Sunday and got laid off. <laughs> Talk about a shoot. So what did I do? I just went to the wrestling school mall that day, that Sunday. I didn't have to go to work, right? So I met a lot of good people at the Kilikowski School of Professional Wrestling. A lot of people like the Perry Saturns. The Tony Roy's. The Tim McNeenies. Cookie Crumble, Brittany Brown, a lot of good people in professional wrestling, a lot of good people in that school. So my first match was June 20th, 1992, and it was in Hudson, Massachusetts. And I did not tell anybody that I knew that I joined professional wrestling. I didn't know I was going to be any good at it. I'm not going to get my behind beat down or what. Did not know. And Walter Kowalski only guaranteed everybody one match. So you pay $1,500, you guaranteed one match. So my one match is coming up June 20th. So a week before my match, I told three other people. I told my uncle, who was sitting down right there. A lot of people know Unc. Raise your hand, Unc. I told my good friend who would end up being my first manager, the judge. Yeah. I told another good friend who would also be in professional wrestling as a commentator and stuff, Quest. My name was the school operator. Walter wanted me to come to the ring, rapping and stuff, getting the people into it, have a good time and stuff. And off we went to Hudson, Mass. So before we got to Hudson, and I was in the car talking to the folks, first of all, I forgot to mention one thing. Growing up, there was two things that my mother forbid me to, to watch. That was professional wrestling, because my parents divorced at an early age, and my father introduced me to sport professional wrestling. And Batman, Adam West Batman, because she said, yeah, she said it was too campy. So if anybody knows me both professionally and, professionally and personally, I grew up obsessed with Batman and professional wrestling, because she wouldn't let me do it, do either one. In my entire career, I always wore red, black, and green, which I got on tonight, and something Batman, a Batman t-shirt. So Batman has that bad symbol. So going to that first match, and Walter always expressed, let the people know it's you. So the guy talking, I'm like, you know, I need something else. I need something for really the people to notice me. Well, they said, well, they're going to come out rapping and stuff. 
They're gonna notice me. I knew I was the only chocolate on the show, so they were gonna notice me because of that. <laughs> but I needed something else, something else. So I said, you know what? How about this? How about I come to the ring and do this? How many people know that? Everybody knows that. You know what they told me? That stupid don't do it, it'll never work. Was a good thing I didn't listen to them. So I came out to the ring and had my first match. That was a double that day. While well, they had two shows, a noon show and a seven o'clock show. These are paid shows, sold shows. That was a different, different wrestling time back then in 1992. So I had the lead-off match with my opponent, Mr. Attitude. And when I tell you the match, absolutely that match was that match was fun. So after the match, I go in the back and I said, you know, Walter, how was the match? A couple of greenhorns out there. Mr. Attitude only had three matches, and that was my first match. So Walter says, oh. I'm like, oh, he didn't like it. So some of the boys in the back said, you know, that's actually good. Because Walter's not one to give out compliments. If your match was really bad, he would have told you it was bad. So you're okay. You're doing good. I'm like, okay. So I'm in the back, and the late eight forward, who is Walter's boss, comes in the back, and they said, they love the rapper. The crowd loves the rapper. Walter sits up. I discovered him. Tell him, T. Tell him, I discovered him. <laughs> I said, Walter, you're the man. You're the best. Walter, kept my mouth shut. Just listen. Walter, you're the man. Age four said, is the rapper coming? Didn't even know my name. Is the rapper coming back on tonight's show? So Walter's like, oh, yes, he's coming back. He's coming back. So Age four left. So I went up to Walter, and I said, Walter, I'm not on the show tonight. You told me that was only that one, one thing. So Walter would have the lineup on cue cards. Anybody that worked for Walter Kowalski know those cue cards. So he pulled out the cue cards for the second show and there was the late, gorgeous Chris Duffy. Yeah. Give him a round of applause. <laughs> the late, gorgeous Chris Duffy versus the candy man. Walter took that pen Scratched out the candy man name, put in the smooth operator. I'm like, cool. That was cool. So we actually went home, because again, I thought I was only wrestling that one match. WCW had a pay-per-view that night. I already paid for the pay-per-view. So we so we went home so I could set my VCR just to go back. I paid good money that pay-per-view. Remember now, I'm unemployed. I'm unemployed. I <laughs> then went back. And the funny thing about Hudson Nass is that when I came out rapping and stuff, apparently Hudson Nass has these damn good hot dogs. So I was handing out these hot dogs on the way back when we took the VCR from my uncle and my two friends. All those hot dogs are good. You have any hot dogs? Well, I didn't have any hot dogs. So they were getting free hot dogs saying, we have some more hot dogs with smooth operator. The smooth operator likes the more hot dogs. They're getting all these hot dogs, so they're hyping up these hot dogs. I want some of these hot dogs. But then we're going back to get me some of these hot dogs. Went back, there was no hot dogs. I'm like, okay, well, let's in, want to go to these places every year. I will get a hot dog. Spoiler alert, we never went back to Hudson Nass. I never, I never got those hot dogs. But that second match I had, I had with the late, gorgeous Chris Duffy. So Chris Duffy talked me in the back and said, you know, Smooth, I seen your match, and a couple of things I want to tweet, so I just kept my mouth shut and I just listened. And that was when I learned psychology. He said, you just have to be with me, brother. You know, they love you and all that stuff, but just be with me. You have to listen to the crowd. You have to tell that story. I knew none of that. I was a greenhorn. Listen to the crowd. Tell the story. So that match was slow paced. He said, you're going too fast. Slow paced, listen, absorb. He was, at one point, he was the best heel in all of New England professional wrestling. So, yes, he was. Yes, he was. So, the match ended, he went over naturally, went over naturally, getting that heel heat and stuff. He told Mel Simons, who was the ring announcer, he says, uh, Mel, tell, tell Smoothie that I'm gonna come in the ring, I'm gonna turn my back to him, have him drop kick me and I'll take a huge bubble on the top of it. So I went there 
and where I was going. Drop kicked him, he took a huge bump, a place to drop it. It was like I went over. Chris Gubby didn't have to do that for me. He did not have to do that for me. But that's when I learned psychology. And I wanted to be the heel. I wanted to be the bad guy. But Walter said, you're not going to be the heel. You're not going to be the bad guy. I wanted to wear a mask. Walter said, you're not going to wear a mask. I wanted to paint my face. Walter said, you're not going to paint your face. Well, I said, don't. That was the way it was. That was the way it was. So, so for the next five years, I came out rapping and clapping and and being a fan favorite, getting cheered and stuff. And uh, to break myself just a little bit, I'm a very likable and lovable guy in real life. So, it was, so I found it easy to get the people to pop for me. But I wanted to really be a heel. And Kowalski would never let me. So five years up into my career, the landscape of New England independent wrestling started to shift. The, the, the sold shows were going by the wayside. Backyarders were throwing shows, undercut paydays, but promotions were starting up. So there was this promotion, CWA, the Century Wrestling Alliance, headed by the late, great Tony Rumble. So I went to a show and I, I was introduced to Tony Rumble by the real deal, or the real heel Joel Davis. And the pink assassins. They brought me in the back and introduced me to Tony Rumble. I said, hey, hello, you know, my name is, uh, you know, they call me the smooth operator. He has heard of me, never seen me work, he has heard of me. So I asked him to give him a tape. And so I gave him a tape. And he said, okay, uh, can you um, can you play heel? Because I am I am thinking about something. I want to reform this group. So I want to know, can you play the heel? Oh, I can play the heel, Tony. Have you ever played the heel on the show? No, Walter won't let me, but four days a week after school when I practice, I practice heel. So I gave Tony a tape, and my wrestling outfits used to be all brightly colored and stuff, airbrushed. So the darkest outfit I had, which was a dark purple, was airbrushed. Did a TV tape for Tony. I was healing, and I was a smooth operator. And so Tony watched that tape, and he said, okay, you're good, we we'll bring you in, but we gotta make some changes. First of all, the smooth operator is a title, it's not a name. So, we should give you a name. And the name I'm thinking is Johnson. I'm like, Johnson? <laughs> I really wasn't feeling that. So, my son was less than 10 months old. And I named my son. So I said, how about Trey? My son is Trey, how about Trey? So Tony liked it, Tony said, okay, you spell Trey, T-R-E, with an accent. I said, okay, that's fine. We're gonna drop the smooth operator. I'm like, okay, that's fine. And the group is gonna be known as the Brotherhood. The Brotherhood. That was a beautiful thing. So my tag, <laughs> my tagline was that I put the brother in the Brotherhood. <laughs> and did we have a lot of fun with promotion and those social shows? Members of the Brotherhood, Knuckles Nelson, Woo! Eric Sprazier. I got to work against workers that I never worked against before. I got to work with a young kid USA, Jen Gillette. I got to work with another Kowalski student, Ron Zombie, who was in the New York Party. We worked against the House of Pain. <laughs> Radio personality, Jeff Katz was a part of that. We had all these pro all these promos. Love you, Jeff. Congratulations, congratulations, Jay. Rich Palladino. Don't forget any better than Rich Palladino, baby. I was awarded the opportunity to be crowned the first NWA New England Cruiserweight Champion. The CWA had got absorbed by the NWA, and I was the first NWA New England Cruiserweight Champion. And I had the opportunity, I was given the opportunity to work at the NWA 50th 
and Cherry Hill, New Jersey, defending, that's right, defending a New England title in New Jersey. Now you look on the map, there is no New Jersey, New England state line. So, so that, that was cool, that was cool. So afterwards, it was time to remove me from the brotherhood. Tony wanted to turn me face. So I got removed from the brotherhood. I was known as Trey the Smooth Operator. And at some point that ran its course. So I worked with that promotion for a couple years. Met a lot of great guys, met a lot of, a lot of great people, a lot of great people. Then I went on to the WWA, Mike Spotter. Mike Spada loved my healing. He didn't like my baby, so he loved my healing, so that was a beautiful thing. I got to be the heel. He didn't want me to be straight the smooth operator because I was known as that with NWA New England. So he was like, I want you to be Trey the smooth criminal. Yes, Slick, you can laugh because I laugh too. <laughs> I said, should I come up there doing the moonwalk and go, hee hee? <laughs> yeah, that's Michael Jackson, he's a smooth criminal. How about trade the smooth operating gangster? So he says, okay, I can, he can live with that. So he let me become trade the smooth operating gangster and had a lot of fun in that promotion as well, cutting a lot of promos and things like that. And, and if anybody knows Mike Spotter, that's a, you know, love that guy, but that's a, that's a, that's a character himself, you know. But in the, but in the WWA, I got to work a whole bunch of matches with Purdy Purdy. We had, we had some great matches. We told some great stories. It was a beautiful thing. Thank you, Purdy. Thank you, Trey. Right before the Rocket Fred Kirby became the champion, we went two months without having a champion. The champion was the late big Dick Dudley, Dr. the Stroud, right, hey, Dick Dudley. And so for three months, we didn't have a champion. I don't know what happened, but Dick, Dick Dudley didn't come to those matches. And we used to work on a Friday and Saturday. So that third match, excuse me, that third month, on that Friday night when we didn't have Dick, Dick Dudley, I told the boys in the back, I said, I'm gonna guarantee that we're gonna have a champion. But how are you going to do that, Smooth? How are you going to do that, Trey? You'll see. So the next night, Saturday night, in Norwood, Massachusetts, I came out there, I cut a promo saying how this promotion didn't have a champion. Well, it has a champion now. I pulled out of my bag the ghetto title and made myself the ghetto champion. Only to be defended in the ghetto. Only to be defended in the ghetto. When you know that maybe next month the Rock and Fred Perry was a champ, we got a champion. <laughs> so Fred Perry was a champ, so we had a champion. So the ghetto title had served its purpose. But you know, it got over it, it got heat. So I, so I kept bringing it. Kept bringing it. Had a lot of good times. And I had the one match with the Rock and Fred Perry. And it was for the WWE Championship. I was, I was the ghetto champion. But the ghetto title was not on the line because the match did not take place in the ghetto. And that's a stipulation of the ghetto championship. Match has to take place in the ghetto. His title was on the line. My title was not on the line. The better man and the champion went over. Fred Kirby, thank you. From then, from there, I went on to work for Steve Burns. Big time wrestling, BTW. Had a lot of fun there. But the best fun I had was teaming with another Kowalski student who I see when he was coming up, when he went there four days a week at the age of 17 because Walter would not let him join. He waited, waited, he joined, he worked his tail off, and he would go on to be the best unsigned talent on the planet. SWB, Slick Wagner Brown. We were a tag team. We were a tag team known as Total Eclipse. And we were faces. And I don't want to be a face.
face, but Steve Perkins wanted me to be a face. And I didn't want to be a face. He said, we'll turn you heel down the line and want to be a face. Oh, no. So, what were we like, three times champions when we were baby faces? Three times, had a lot of fun, had a lot of fun with those promos. Then we turned heel, and that was a beautiful thing. Once we turned heel, we brought in somebody else, another brother of mine, and the fun just kept on getting continued. Brother, Bobby Ocean. We were not known as Total Eclipse. We cut a promo, and then I said BTW, and just like that, black, talented wrestlers. BTW, black, talented wrestlers. And Steve Perkins was the man. The man was against us. The man was against us. So, that was a lot of fun. Now, I wonder what would happen if some promotion with backing ever put three brothers together. Do you think that would get over? Huh? Yeah. Think that would get over, huh? <laughs> so, I want to thank you guys. Slick, you know how I feel about you, man. I love you, brother. Thank you. Bobby, you know I love you. Thank you. Now, when we turn heel, it was a story, right? We had music that was already made for us, and it was not how you fall, it's how you get up. That was heel music. And the writer and performer of that is sitting right here, Richie McCrary of Richie Rich and 24 Karen Funk. <laughs> 24K Productions.com, check them out. <laughs> always plugging, always plugging. And his former band manager, now a band manager for a different band, the Oakland Soul Band, G. Marie Mike. Thank you, I love you guys, I love you guys. So, I want to back up just a little bit. When Tony Rumble wanted me to be healed, he said, you know, you have to change your look. I don't like your look, so come up with something. So, I was the one that made my own singlets, so I had to come up with a heel outfit. So the heel outfit I came up with was a darker singlet and black pants that I hung past my behind. I forgot to mention that because that's very important. That's very important. So Tony Rumble had the trust in me to modify what I was wearing. So, so. get ready to wrap this up because I wrote down some. I just want to make sure that I thank some people. And I don't want to miss out anybody, but. About those pants, contrary to popular belief, those pants were not sewn in, they were not velcroed in. That was two different pieces, the singlet and the pants. So people always want to know, how did those pants stay up? And my answer has always been, because I have a damn good imagination. That's how those pants stay up. <laughs> so in conclusion, I just want to thank all the people that I have worked with. Give yourselves a hand. All the people I've worked with. It was always about telling that story and entertaining the fans. I want to thank all my managers I've had over the years. I want to thank my very first manager, the judge. I want to thank Vinny Capelli. I want to thank Tracy Taylor. I want to thank Vito Calucci. And I want to thank Ms. Demina. <laughs> want to thank my mother, because if it wasn't for her denying me watching professional wrestling and watching Batman, we wouldn't be having this conversation. I probably would have grown up normal. <laughs> and my kids would probably think I'd be bored. I want to thank Fellow workout warriors, I told the workout warriors at the gym, LA Fitness in Saugus, Massachusetts. This is out to the workout warriors and fellow workout warrior, Fred, coming down to show the love. Thank you, Fred, and thank you, Letty. Thank you. And once again, thank you to my children. You're welcome.
my two I most, you. my two, and I love you too, baby girls. My two most important championships. So I'm gonna end it with the catchphrase. I likes my Scorilla and Cash. I likes my shorties fast.